I would like to welcome you to uh, this event organized by the Brunei Gallery, um, SOAS, or School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. Um, it's uh, titled uh, Of Jesus and Opium, um, Missionaries and the Opium Wars. Um, in the title you have all the components of the, um, of, of the exhibition, which was organized by um, the a curator of this exhibition, namely um, Iris Yao, uh, Yao uh, Zengman, who has um, a lot of experience with the um, with both the subject matter and the historical background. She's a lecturer and curator at the University of the Arts, uh, London. Um, she's also a fellow of the um, uh, Higher Education Academy and of the Royal Society of the Arts. Um, her background in, um, in clothes is coming to the fore in this exhibition too. Um, before she uh, joined the academic world, she was active in the procurement of clothes um, on the international market and therefore she knows very well the, also the history of uh, the clothes production, especially silk, and the usage of um, uh, certain commodities that were being transported from China to the West. Um, we're going to start off with this point, but I would also like to say that um, the um, experience of my counterpart in this conversation uh, is visible in every single object that you can see in this exhibition, and it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce these to you. If you have any questions, you can send them to us, afterwards perhaps as well. Um, uh, of course this will be a different format now but it doesn't matter. It's, um, we are very happy to have you here at SOAS in order to show you some artifacts which show us the, uh, the development of the trade between especially Britain, the West, but especially Britain and China during a very crucial point in time. Myself, just two words. I, my name is uh, uh, Dr. Lars Peter Lahman. I work for the History Department at the um, School of Oriental and African Studies. Um, you can visit the AHRP website, History, Religions and Philosophies, in order to find out a little bit more. Um, my own background in uh, terms of uh, Chinese history is that I have lived in the north of China in Beijing, so my, uh, but I've visited uh, Hong Kong on a number of occasions, so I'm also familiar with the setting uh, of today's session. So I'm going to start off by uh, introducing the star of the exhibition, namely the opium poppy, and you can see that um, the specimen that you have here um, namely the Papa somniferum, it's the, the sleep-inducing poppy, is um, the, the um, plant out of which the raw opium was produced, which in turn was refined in order to produce the smoking opium, Changu in Malay, uh, which um, it was to become the hallmark of 19th century leisure life in China. Here on the, um, in this uh, image you can see in this uh, very uh, nice little um, um, object you can see two, a, a reclining couple and this uh, just shows an aspect of opium culture, namely that it was used for um, relaxed conversation um, between friends, between couples, uh, sometimes even with the entire family, but um, uh, also uh, in opium houses, opium houses which were more or less the extensions of tea houses. So this becomes part of China's um, public sphere during the 19th century. Now, if we look at the uh, way that opium is produced, it is um, the opium paste is produced by extracting the sap that flows out of the poppy once it is cut with a sharp implement, something like a scalpel or a, um, a 
a razor blade um, and uh, it has to be collected before sunrise because otherwise it becomes um, too solid to be condensed into the paste that is then boiled and preserved. And it's this substance that from roughly the end of the um, 18th century onwards, from the 1790s onwards, was being exported to China. My question, my first question to you is, what do you think the long-term impact of this early opium trade was? How do the Chinese people remember this period today? Wow, that is a long question, a long answer, I think. But then, this is the result of um, Hong Kong became British colony, and then it started a century of um, an untreaty, uh, an equal treaty you know, of China, China and West, mainly England, Britain, and America, and France. Um, also, it's very interesting because opium, you know, papaver sulfomia, it was a plant and it became a currency to buy things from China and also became a, a weapon. So it's, you know, along the way, and it really changed the history and big time, you know, in a big time. Um, so, yeah. Yes. So it's a, a very ambivalent um, plant to start with, or ambivalent drug that, that was um, extracted from the plant. Um, initially, over the centuries, and you can trace this back historically to the Tang period, so mm -hmm. to the um, uh, 8th century, 6th, 7th century, um, where you have uh, Arab traders who transport medical opium, medicinal opium, wrapped into beeswax to keep it um, dry during the passage. Um, this was used in India, in southern China, was used in various other parts of Eastern Asia, especially Southeast Asia, in order to enrich the uh, local medical tradition. So tra uh, Ayurvedic medicine in India, um, Ch Chinese medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, but also the medical traditions of Southeast Asia. They all have certain recipes where opium plays a role. Now, opium had a few functions medicinally, which um, made it a very precious commodity. For very example, nice. it reduces fever. If you're suffering from malaria, from cholera, it can reduce that fever. Another function is that it um, stills diarrhea, so that, because diarrhea may, you may think it's something that you is very inconvenient, but actually in the pre-modern world it was one of the biggest killers and if you're in um, uh, uh, underdeveloped areas or at the wrong place at the wrong time it can actually kill. So this is one of the functions of uh, opium. It's also a, a hunger suppressant. So uh, couriers who carried uh, weights, they look very skinny, but actually uh, with a little bit of uh, opium the impression, it, it gave the body the impression that they could cope without food. So there, there are also other um, uh, medicinal functions, but probably the most important one is that it uh, acts as an analgesic, so it's, uh, it has a um, very powerful uh, sleep-inducing quality, it reduces pain levels, and of course it's used today as well as such, so morphine, you find it in any, you find morphine preparations in any hospital because um, this is simply what the um, uh, what, uh, without without morphine um, uh, the the modern um, surgical tradition wouldn't have emerged because uh, you can't operate without sedating uh, patients and uh, sending them to sleep. Um, and then final function again today if you go into any pharmacy. Uh, if you have a strong cough, you have medicine that contains codeine. Codeine is an opium product, it's an opiate. And um, this is why people in the past used opium. Now, how did they use it? In the West, they used to drink it. Not out of the bottle, but they 
it was blended with other um, with, with other medical substances and also a little bit of sugar because it was very bitter. That's the so-called laudanum, laudam in, in, in Latin, means the praiseworthy um, the drug. And this praiseworthiness is quite simply because it was used as a panacea, a medicine that could cure absolutely everything. And this is the basis upon which opium was being traded for centuries, for many centuries, going back actually into Roman and Byzantine antiquity, origins you find in Anatolia, uh, but the Chinese knew the opium, uh, medicinal opium very well, but it was never actually abused until the 18th century when it's been blended with tobacco and then in just a few decades later um, it was being developed into a smoking, uh, into a smoking paste which could be um, uh, smoked in long opium pipes. But we'll talk about that in a little while. So um, when I asked uh, my uh, uh, the organizer of this exhibition to uh, uh, show us a um, an image of this opium consumption, uh, she produced a wonderful piece, which um, is um, uh, from Q, I think. From Q Gardens. Kew Gardens. Yes. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about the, the Q Gardens collection? Yes, oh, Kew Gardens, you would have so many, just like in this country, many hidden gems, you know, archive. And this is just one of many I discover, or we discover. A Kew Garden archive um, is the economic botany collection. So basically, anything make of plants, and they will have a, a, you know, an item there. So you can see that one is made of wood, and it is, it's just like Laura just said, from an opium, from what uh, RP before, it's an uh, ansoma, from a, you know, humble, can we say humble? Mm -hmm. Humble plants to become a luxury mm -hmm. habit. Mm -hmm. And so this is a really good example. You see, they, you know, and you know, uh, this handcraft um, is dating back an, Nineteen, late nineteenth century, um, the chain high society. It's only it's so rare and so expensive. It's only the high, you know, rich and famous, you know, can really afford to have it. And you can, this is a, just a good example that you can see, the you know, not the costume, the clothes, you know, even mm. though you know the food is you know food binding because that is a status thing. Mm. And then they use opium pipe mm. you know, to smoke. And, it's the, uh, and the furniture they use. Yes. Um, mm. So this is one of the uh, yeah, mm. one of the many wonderful things you know, I discover in yes. Kew Garden. Okay. Yes. Talking about the price and the fact that it was uh, considered a, a luxury item during the uh, 19th century, uh, this is something that was actually changed because in the beginning opium was relatively cheap. It was produced in the West, in the Eastern Mediterranean, um, and then also in some areas of Iran, and it was shipped into Eastern, the Eastern half of Asia, uh, where it was being used both for medicinal purposes, but then also in Southeast Asia for uh, pleasure. Um, not in the same way that we uh, know it, it was blended with tobacco, and um, perhaps some, sometimes perhaps also with other uh, medicinal herbs, but importantly, it was relatively cheap. And this is something which the um, English traders belonging to the East India Company uh, learned that it was difficult to market this type of cheap commodity, which was also a, um, a medicine. It's like selling cough medicine as a, an expensive drink. It doesn't work. You have to make something special out of it. So what they did in the uh, 1790s was to cross over different types of opium which produced a very strong um, narcotic effect. This narcotic effect was of course being um, enhanced by the fact that the opium became more expensive so it could be sold as a, um, a luxury item for the upper classes but it had to be smuggled because after 1728, the, um, an edict, an imperial edict in China by the Yongzheng Emperor 
prohibited any kind of uh, uh, opium products that could be smoked for pleasure. And therefore, uh, opium that arrived in China had to be medicinal opium. It was very different, so they, they could immediately tell the two apart. But from the 1790s onwards, um, the traders belonging to the East India Company, but not in the name of the East India Company, they began to smuggle it into southern China, southern Chinese waters, where it was taken up by pirates, who then smuggled it into the interior along the waterways. And what you can see in the background here are images from India, where you see, uh, this is not all opium, but some of it is, uh, where, where it's being um, planted in, uh, on territory that belonged to the East India Company, or to uh, princes who had um, uh, contracts with the East India Company. So it comes from Bengal, it comes from the, um, uh, from the um, uh, subcontinental side of uh, Bengal. Calcutta is the um, uh, port which was used in order to store the opium, the prepared opium paste in big balls, and um, it's, it was, set, uh, it was um, shipped from there, from Calcutta, uh, to various locations in Southeast Asia, uh, often by Dutch traders, but in order to reach uh, Guangdong, so Canton, uh, so the Cantonese province, um, and then through the waterways of the Pearl River, the uh, Zhukyang, um, it had to be uh, deposited in, on certain islands where it was picked up by smaller ships that took it inland. So the whole period between 1800 and 1840 is one of increasing um, illegal trade in opium. So it was basically smuggled into the interior. And this is where we enter the uh, years just before the Opium War. And of course, we have here behind us beautiful examples of um, objects that were uh, consumed together that were produced, sorry, uh, together with the consumption of opium. Um, but before I begin with this, a brief word on the silk, and perhaps Yao um, uh, Zhangman uh, can explain what the significance of silk is in the China trade. Well, silk, you know, it, was, um, it, it wasn't introduced to the West or other country until the Silk Road back in 2nd century, before Common Era, the Han Dynasty. So, because it's so rare, again, it's so expensive, that's why the rules called seal roll. Um, but then, you know, this is, the, the seal is just part of it, part of the, um, the demand for Chinese art and Chinese you know, goods, like porcelain tea, um, for the well, for British merchant, we've been talking about the focus on the the Britain side to use opium to but instead of paying silver and they use opium because they went out of silver and in Britain they didn't have enough silver they had to import from the continent but the continent didn't have it they, in, it, they import from somewhere else um, mm. but then that is another another subject um, so you know silk you know, use it, it it's really it's, it, you know it's it's a status thing you know in the old ancient time, it's only only the empire, the noble people, can afford to wear silk. Um, so it definitely, you know, is a is a status thing. And in the common people, you're not allowed to wear silk. But then, you know, because it's just so it's so soft, you know, so um, shiny, and then you know, demand is getting higher and higher from other country. Um, so this is an example of you know why why you know the, the demand. Um, of Chinese art and, and silver goods, you know, are so high at that time. Yes. And why, 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 why did they need to grow so much opium? <laughs> yeah. So this is the crux. So how did we arrive at the opium war? Because all the imports from China, that is silk, that is porcelain, China ware, um, um, and tea, they all needed to be paid for in silver and the universal currency at the time were the um, silver dollars which were being minted in 
by using Mexican silver. <laughs> and it was, they had the uh, eagle, the double-headed eagle of the uh, Habsburg Empire on it. So this is the Spanish silver dollar or the Habsburg silver dollar, which because the House of Habsburg united the Austro-Hungarian Empire with the Spanish Empire, they owned more or less the entire, um, the, the eastern half, uh, the non-Brazilian half of, uh, of South America. Because of this, the Chinese concluded that the only currency that they could accept were these Spanish silver dollars. Sometimes also other silver, like little silver ingots that you could get from Japan. But um, there, there were um, a few exceptions. But everybody, all the European traders, they were supposed to pay for uh, their exports in silver. Um, one problem, one in three ships sink. So it was a loss-making exercise, even for, if you take into account the enormous profit margins that the Westerners had when they, the East India companies arrived in Europe in their different uh, harbors. Um, but the, only the British uh, thought of a system of circumventing this payment system in silver, namely they started paying by means of opium. Of course that was illegal, but it was very profitable and this contraband opium quickly replaced um, a large proportion of the silver that they used to pay to the uh, Chinese customs, the uh, Canton customs, and um, this was a financial reason why the Qing state decided to penalize the British because they had started to upset the trade balance which had, um, which had been established over the past um, almost 100 years, 80 years by then. So, um, when we look at silver, when we look at tea, we actually mean opium during this time. In the background, you can see some of the paraphernalia that was used in order to smoke opium. So behind us, we see these three pipes. They are actually quite simple pipes. They are elegant, of course, but um, if you go to certain museums, you can see ones that are made out of very expensive materials with inlays of uh, jade and so on, uh, they were also a status symbol and it's this uh, uh, the quality of being very expensive that um, made it part of the uh, guest picture. Mm -hmm. You could only present, of course, China, you come as my guest, I will give you the very best, mm -hmm. best wine, best tea, best opium, of course. And uh, th this, is the, uh, this is one of the reasons why opium was being used uh, for social functions that are um, otherwise out of reach for the normal population. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, and uh, here we also have a few other um, uh, remarkable um, objects. The one that I perhaps like best is the uh, poster uh, advertising the, um, uh, I think it's Madame Tussauds exhibition, where you have two wax figures, uh, one showing a, um, a, a Chinese lady who is the wife of Lin Zexu, who you see to the right. L uh, Commissioner Lin was a um, person with a strong interest in uh, reducing, actually stopping the opium trade completely because he was opposed to any kind of um, uh, illicit entertainment. Um, he was a very principled Confucian who believed that it was wrong to, uh, for the population to be drugged, more or less, and therefore lose their own free will. This is the, um, the Confucian. Of course, he was also the representative of a certain political movement. It's a long story. But um, the um, uh, main reason why the Opium War erupted was because he, on behalf of the Qing dynasty, decided to have the opium destroyed that was lying outside uh, Guangzhou. Um, and uh, this destruction was penalized by the, by the British by means of uh, uh, naval uh, ships, especially 
one ship, the Nemesis, which had uh, uh, steel clapping, so it was protected by from bullets, from ordinary uh, Chinese weapons. Um, with the latest inventions of the uh, Industrial Revolution, and this enabled the British Navy to sail through the defences and to lay waste to the um, city of Guangzhou. So this is the this is the beginning of the Opium War. The Opium War itself is very short compared to other wars, very destructive, and it leads to the first of the unequal treaties, which you can see behind us, namely the Treaty of Nanjing. <laughs> Here you can see the, 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 the battle itself. Uh, it, it was short. The number of ships involved was not enormous, uh, but it is the symbolical power, because yeah. As you know, it is the point where, in Chinese history, where modern history begins. So this is the turning point. So you move from the imperial phase of Chinese history into denatural, so into the mod modern uh, period. Um, it's of course completely artificial from a historical viewpoint, <laughs> but um, it's uh, meant to indicate that from this time onwards, China was in no longer the most important power in this part of the world, and this is encapsulated in the Treaty of Nanjing, Nanjing Jiaoyue, which uh, has um, a number of uh, stipulations which mostly concede treaty ports to the Western traders, not just to the British, but the traders who used to be confined to the um, a strip of land in the Pearl River in the uh, city of Guangzhou. They could now trade with the cities, with the ports where they used to trade which before 1756. Um, and um, this stretch concluded with a new settlement that is known as Shanghai, that's far from the north, but in the south. Maybe you could say that. That's the, um, uh, there was a, a rock which gave shelter to the, um, to the ships um, that the British had brought along, and they bought it uh, in uh, Cantonese Hong Kong. <laughs> so that's the beginning of uh, Hong Kong, the history of Hong Kong. That was um, actually, you know, before, before signing the Treaty of Nanking, the um, so called, we call it the Westerner, they were gathered in Macau, you know, near Hong Kong. So they were there already. But then it is, you know, it's really after signing the Treaty of Nanking, it's officially possessed the island of Hong Kong. Because because you know China is so bad they deserve China Sea and they need somewhere the uh, Lord Palmerston, you know, the famous mm. Lord Palmerston, um, the foreign secret secretary at that time, he, he actually he requests demand one or two islands for Britain you know, the, the army, the, the, the merchant to, to rest and to open up trade. So they, um, the Chinese commissioner, Yong uh, Ying, so he suggests either Hong Kong or Kowloon, you know, just opposite, and then what later become the whole part of China, Hong Kong anyway. Um, so they were there, um, this after that, and then officially, Hong Kong became British colony, but then they were there back in 1841. 1841. And it was a so they picked you know they picked Hong Kong basically. Mm -hmm. then they picked Hong Kong were there, and then continue other business. You know, smuggling opium, you know, all trade by itself. You know. So that is the the start of Hong Kong is really not the Treaty of Nanking, but before, but it's officially started there. That's right. So and it's this um, it's at this point that the missionaries become legal again because we um, we've talked about silk we've talked about opium um, we've talked about trade east west trade but one aspect of the east western um, contacts namely uh, the transfer of knowledge the transfer of ideas that had happened over the centuries and. Many of these um, uh, travelers had been um, 
have been communicators of other beliefs, religious beliefs. So you have Christian missionaries as well for about a thousand years already at that time. But in the 18th century, 1724, um, the Western missionaries are confined to either Beijing or Macau. And Macau, as Yautam um, uh, 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 rightly said, was the, um, not the possession, it was the harbor where the Europeans were guests, guests of the Chinese Empire. So it was not the colony. It was on the other side of the Pearl River Delta, seen from Hong Kong. And um, the British, also other Protestant traders, they were uncomfortable there because that was in the, it was predominantly uh, inhabited by Catholic Europeans and they wanted another possession which, uh, where they could be free. free yeah. Yes, and it's this idea that made them look out for another a type of Macau, but on the other yes. side, that's what... Just like Macau, okay. Yes. That's right, yes. Free. So, th this, is, this is initially, th th this is the initial point of the, the new missions. And, of course, it starts off with um, uh, uh, Robert Morrison, but Robert Morrison is not actually involved in the opium trade. Uh, he's a very... Uh, he's, he deals with the, the normal, the ordinary uh, trading functions of the East India Company. Um, but it's from that time onwards that the missionaries who were based in, um, uh, in Melaka, in Southeast Asia, in what is nowadays M uh, Malaysia, some of them also from Batavia, so from Jakarta, they, they made their way over to Hong Kong. And um, gradually, gradually, the, um, uh, it became a colony, an inhabited colony. And the role of the Westerners was initially much stronger because um, there were fewer Chinese. The Chinese came in waves, and these waves were often refugee waves. For example, the first one, the Taiping Rebellion. So mm. After only uh, 15 years, you had the first um, uh, significant numbers of Chinese who arrived. And um, of course, by the end of this long process, the Chinese were in the vast majority. And the Westerners, especially the British, a tiny minority. So, talking about the missionaries, we move on to another section of the exhibition, which is on the opposite side, where we can see books. And you can see on the, um, uh, well, here you can see the, um, you can see the symbol of the, uh, the new Hong Kong, um, of course, with the uh, Bohemia, uh, flower which is um, uh, which you will find on every um, official uh, document and uh, uh, insignium of the uh, of the territory which is now uh, of course a lot in the news but uh, it's the um, uh, it's the from 1997 onwards Hong Kong is no longer a British um, possession. It's this period that in Chinese history books is uh, characterized as the, the century or the long century of national humiliation, war trigger. And uh, when Deng Xiaoping, of course he, he died, he passed away, but his last wish was to bring this period of, uh, of national shame to an end. And this is, uh, was symbolized by the transfer of uh, Hong Kong uh, from the status of a colony to that of uh, part of China, mainland China, and this is the this is the significance. So, the, if people uh, in the West um, talk about Hong Kong, they often forget that in the Chinese context, Hong Kong is always linked to the Opium Wars, and this is why um, there is a, a basic misunderstanding between. Uh, Chinese people and Westerners often, because in the West people are quite oblivious of this opium war as the founding principle of the um, uh, of, of uh, as the founding um, reason uh, for for Hong Kong. And here you can see um, beautiful maps which come from the early colonial period. So um, they they give you an impression of Hong Kong as being 
inhabited by very few um, Westerners, and um, of course, what, one of the most impressive buildings is, is still there today, the palace of the governor. And this is the, um, uh, of course, now in the middle of a park. And uh, Hong Kong um, itself has very few inhabitable um, uh, spaces um, because it is essentially a rock. And all the streets uh, meander around uh, very uh, steep um, uh, approaches to the, to the two peaks which, which you have. Victoria Peak, so called Victoria Peak, is, uh, is of course the one that you can. Uh, uh, travel up to in a cable car. So this is the mm -hmm. <laughs> this is something that you go up in space. Yes. Yeah. yes, that's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, now um, yes, this is very interesting. Yes. This from the Italian yes. written room right in the chain. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, the, the background? <laughs> oh this is just one of the um, the map when Hong Kong or Gaolong, Hong Kong Gaolong was still part of Chen, China. So it's 19th century, and it's, uh, it's done by Italian missionary. So you know, it's a lot of things they, you know, the missionary have done in in in, in China or in, in Hong Kong, and then yeah, and it's like you know, here you've mm -hmm. got the Hong Kong University, co-founded by before you know before the before the university, it was the Hong uh, Hong Kong Medicine. Chinese, well, Chinese Medicine College, That's and right. then became Hong Kong University in yeah. 1912, co founded by Benjamin Hoss Hossen. That's right, yeah. He's from so the, he was from London Missionary, yes. London Missionary Society. Missionary Society. Missionary Society later becomes the London Missionary Society. So you have a, a very close relationship between the missionaries and the, let's call them the imperialists, or the, we have the administrators of the British Empire and the traders and importantly um, some of the missionaries increasingly towards the end of the 19th century they are trained medical experts as a medical experts rather than uh, medical professionals because the medical modern medical profession is being uh, shaped during this time and here if you happen to be in London the most important uh, centers of um, medical learning would not have been in the main hospitals but in private practices such as Harley Street because we have Dr. Harley there. The Wellcome collection, yes, because mm -hmm. we have Dr. Wellcome. So in other words, this was the time when medicine was being transformed into the type of modern scientific medicine that we know today. Of course, also in other parts of the world. And if you look at the um, archives in the Welcome Collection, for example, or at SOAS, in the special collections, so as, um, uh, 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 the, the archival part of the SOAS library, um, you will find letters written mm -hmm. by uh, the various medical missionaries, and they are discussing this, the best way of treating uh, diseases, and by the end of the 19th century, they're also discussing ways of uh, ending the opium smoking habit, which people have become used to in the 19th century. Mr. Norman, the, um, the, well, the, the material in the special collection, you know, find so many letters, you know, what they recall, you know, we got some on display, you know, we call it opium traffics. Yes, let's, the, let's walk uh, over there, and we can see the, some, some examples of the... Um, uh, the Missionary, they introduced what well, we could say Western, Western medicine, especially in Hong Kong. You know, they can do so freely. It really, you know, this this modern exchange and you know, combined with traditional Chinese medicine and then with the Western. So that that is quite a you know, quite a milestone. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. And then what can we see behind you there? Yes, sir. Oh, behind here um, is you know, this, this section is about silk. Um, so you can see the you know silk cocoon where the silk come from, and then this is some you know part of Gla you know, Gladys Edward you know, collection. We'll come to that later, and um, and then this is this is an example 
the free trade when they are buying silk back in 19th century, 1836, and it's very significant. Um, it's the original letter by a merchant who was reading, and he was a secretary to Royal, Asa a a Royal Asiatic Society. Um, but then what we have got here is the it's a map of China <laughs> make off. What is it make off? It may, it may, it may. It's, it's not made of silk, yes, yeah, it's made of silk, yes, exactly, yes. So it, it crossed in any case, but yeah. it's a silk mask. So yes. we can see the five treaty parts, you know, here, you know, yes. if you get closer, with, my, with glasses, you know, for <laughs> some people. Yes. Yeah. And then we, you know, a, um, a register for missionary. And here, you know, we, you know, the, the, the archive is, you know, it's really amazing. You know, something like, this is just one of the main examples. The register, you know, register, um, like you know, this page has got again Benjamin Hobson. When did he sign up? When did he retire? When did he die? When? All this, you know, and the century um, of London, London missionary. So it's, you know, it's, it, this is just really that few sample from the huge collection, you know, special special collection here. So these are all examples from our archives. So whether they are <coughs> textual or, um, or, or physical, and, and, and of course <coughs> the significance of silk is, is very important because uh, that is what uh, had taken the Westerners since Roman times to China. That was the um, the Romans called them Latin the Ceres, the silk people. Yeah. Um, so and here we find. Um, um, a display cabinet which shows you examples of missionary work. Uh, the, also something from the SOAS collections. This is Robert Morrison yes. with his uh, um, uh, Ch Chinese Assistant. assistants yeah. while he's translating his version of the Bible. And um, <clears throat> uh, of course, he was in competition with Marshman, who was uh, in um, Kankabar in the um, uh, in the Danish possession in, of, in India, um, where they could um, translate, protected from the, uh, the Anglican Church, the English Church. So uh, anyway, that's a, a sub-chapter of the, of the Opium War. Um, so uh, Morrison is not really involved in the Opium trade. There are the missionaries, like uh, good stuff, who travels on British ships, and um, um, he probably used uh, some of the uh, proceeds of the opium trade in order to uh, print um, his pamphlets and finance his journey. But uh, again, he did not profit in, a, in an enormous way from, from this. So th this connection is slightly misleading also because in the beginning most of the missionaries, they were quite supportive of opium because they thought of it as a medicine. Mm -hmm. So it's the, even if it was smoked, they thought it had the same medical um, effects of uh, laudanum, so they thought it was, there was nothing wrong with it. It's only from the end of the uh, 19th century onwards, especially after the Taiping Wars, that they become uh, increasingly opposed to opium. And the, um, uh, the pamphlets that you can see here, or the, uh, the writings, they are, um, they, they are, uh, uh, Yes, these are copies yeah. of the New New Testament, yeah. uh, which are, uh, of course, being printed in Hong Kong now. They're, they were previously previously printed in Melaka and in other places in Southeast Asia, um, in because uh, the distribution of missionary work in the Chinese interior was still illegal until the illegal until the Second Opium War. So-called Second Opium War, the Arab War in 1860, sorry, 1858, um, and um, it's uh, that war which allowed uh, all Westerners, but especially the missionaries, to enter the interior of China. And it's from that time onwards, so that's the second of the uh, unequal treaties, that um, uh, the um, people in the interior are allowed to uh, receive these uh, Christian scriptures for the first time in um, more than a century, 120 years. But in actual fact, they had already received uh, 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 
pamphlets and booklets which were, had been printed in Beijing or outside Beijing and then distributed throughout uh, underground. Yes, underground, this underground uh, market. <laughs> uh, but, but anyway, this is the age of opium and of course the important thing to remember is that opium smoking proliferates during this time in China. So in the end, by the end of the 19th century, there's hardly any household that wouldn't, would not be seen. Then I have here the something maybe you would like to say something about this missionary. So the uh, mm -hmm. 20th century now. Mm -hmm. Moving on to 20th century. So this is a um, display for Gladys Arwood. She she you know, she's very remarkable. And she had a Chinese name, I mm -hmm. Um so she was a a housemaid in London and then she did, she she designed she wanted to become a missionary. And she started to join China in a, uh, in a mission, but they said, you know, she, you know, she, her, her education level is too low, and then they reject her. But then, you know, she's just being her, I think, you know, went to China just by train anyway, and then uh, joined the Inns of Happiness, one of these um, uh, places, you know, giving look after the poor people, orphanage, uh, orphans, and then, uh, but she, had a main role. She, her role is you know, to cut, you know, cut the uh, foot binding. This foot binding was um, again, you know, was um, popular for the high society. So it, it was a status thing. Um, but then it became, you know, less, you know, less, you know, popular or you know, it just it's just not right. Um, mm. And then her job is to cut, you know, all this, you know, foot, you know, bind, you know, bind the foot, you know, the young girls. And then, so this is, um, you look, look like a very ordinary scissors, but it's really extraordinary because that, that is scissors you use. And you see with the, the case, and I believe this is, uh, is you know, make of silk, you know, it's very traditional Chinese embroidery. And then, like us, you know, when we go somewhere, we collect things, souvenir, or we collect things, and then, you know, just the seal, you know, have the, um, the, the, the dough, make of, make of seal, the slipper, and then we got this, we really, you know, precious This is, um, the it's that shape, you know, you see the shoes, you know, you see the size, and it's, you know, they're, they're make of seal. So these are from, from a special collection, again. And then, she just, she didn't just did that, and when she was in China, um, she, that was, you know, during the Second World War, um, so this is a letter she wrote to her friends, you know, back in England here, and you can tell the, the, the colour, because, you know, she didn't write it in one go, it's whenever she can. It recorded, you know, very vivid, you know, the, um, she called enemy, it was the, the Japanese invasion to China, um, getting closer, the, you know, the noise, and, and it's very, yeah, very vivid, and she and then she took a group of the you know, ovens, um, ovens, um, to a safety place, you know, through hills, you know, mountain, you know, some of these uh, places, but then arrived see us safely. And she's, you know, she's very remarkable in, in terms of him. You know, she was one of the very few foreigner mm has -hmm. a Chinese citizenship. Um, and then when she was, you know, older, she actually did, you know, set up a, uh, the whole mission in Hong Kong. And then, I think she was um, 86, and then she passed away in Thailand. And this is a, this is a, the, the book, the eulogy um, of her life, 16 page. And you, you look at what people write, you know, you, you know you want a noble life, what a meaningful life she, she lived. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah. so, so we are talking about uh, contradictions and one contradiction is that opium, which was uh, such a precious commodity from a medical viewpoint, that it could actually become a um, highly addictive and, uh, well, <laughs> in, in the longer run, uh, actually uh, a, um, a very... Um, uh, damaging um, uh, habit forming drug which um, took a long time to be eradicated from China um, but of course many of the uh,
drugs that were being used in order to wean the population off there. For example, heroin. <laughs> heroin was used as a drug, and so as an opium replacement drug. And um, the, the doctors who administered heroin in the beginning had no idea that it was um, that the effects of heroin consumption were was worse than uh, uh, smoking opium. But it's of course part of the uh, opium smoking habit which emerged during the 19th century. So that's one contradiction, that between um, recreational uses of opium and um, medicinal uses. The second one is the role of the missionaries, often referred to as agents of imperialism, but actually uh, in the vast majority doing very useful work and towards the um, 20th century concentrating on um, on the creation of education, on the provision of education and of medicinal services. Medical staff, whether these were doctors or um, nurses, they were often directly related to the missionary stations that uh, the, uh, the missionaries set up. And even feminism, because, oh, um, yes. because you know, uh -huh. the, um, well, the Chinese women, they didn't want male to inspect them, and they opened up that opportunity. So, mm -hmm. you know, there was a demand. We need more female uh, missionary you know, to China to help. So yeah, everything yeah. comes. You know, to that, that. That's right. Yes. So we have um, well, we almost uh, finished our journey through time, and uh, this is in essence the. Um, uh, so when we talk about um, the opium era in China, of course, it is very long because it takes us back to the. Uh, uh, to, to, to the beginnings of the Chinese Empire, more or less, but um, uh, it is particularly uh, significant from the um, middle of the 19th century onwards, and it dominated the whole of the 19th century up to the fall of the Qing Dynasty in 1911. And it so, will change, yeah. yes. So thank you very much for uh, uh, for your attention, and uh, of course you would like. I want to what? Yes, okay. Yes. Yes. One, one yes. So we have one question from our audience, <laughs> um, which is uh, from Dennis. He said the exhibition is really excellent, educative, informative, and visual. And he asks, are there any plans to extend it, Iris? I think you know we should ask John, not me. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know yet, you know, but we we got something on the line up. So, but then likely. Will be in another another venue. It will be. It, it's on a journey. It will be on tour. We just you know, likely will be in another venue. So you you will put it. You'll take it somewhere else. Oh yeah, yeah. So it'll be yeah. available yeah. to look at again. Yes. And then the another question that he asks is: thinking of all the treasures from around the world, including China, that are in the British Museum, how do we get the word out about the importance of exhibitions? that done in conjunction and with the permission of diasporas and that address the historic extraction of artefacts from other parts of the world. Who wants to start with that? <laughs> Both of us, maybe. Yeah. 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 Start with us. <laughs> okay, well, this is, of course, an enormous topic, uh, but um, we, <laughs> well, yeah, say my personal opinion is that, uh, that art and knowledge are universal. So they should actually be exhibited in as many places in the world as possible so that the local populations get the chance to see um, aspects of uh, civilization, world civilization, which they otherwise can't see. So this is an a priori uh, opinion. Uh, but of course, uh, I know that art collectors, uh, they know what is expensive, they know what is precious, and they also know how to obtain uh, objects illegally. So, so many objects were simply stolen, and uh, to, to have part of those repatriated, uh, of course with uh, proper procedures, um, that, that, that is also a priority. So it's both, it's a little bit of both, but I, I do think that um, uh, items belonging to uh, minorities or to, to other ethnic groups in the world um, that they um, that they should be shared with the rest of the world as well um, but um, how to do that best is of course down to the 
representatives of these communities and the, the museums in the West? Um, ideally, yeah, yes, but then I think, you know, um, all this amazing object, where it, where, you know, where it came from, I think, you know, need to, yeah, well, we, we, we did a really good job to persuade, uh, uh, persuade so many, you know, amazing archives, but then we can, we, we can also share this knowledge, how to, you know, preserve, you know, all these items in their own country, you know, if, we, if, if, if the objects obtained from the violent, you know, you know, under the violent circumstances, then we should, we should return, not we, you know, the, the, you know, whatever, should, but at least they, they have that intention mm -hmm. to offer. Because, you know, you want to return something to some places they may not want it, because we don't have the resources. Mm -hmm. But then, that is, I think that is really another level, mm -hmm. the, you know, the moral duty, another level, mm -hmm. you know. We love it so much, we can do it, but then we help other people mm -hmm. and then give it to the rightful place and you know, give people the choice, not just think we do better. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Lucy Corset from the Brunei Gallery. I just wanted to say thank you so, so much to our speakers, not just for giving up their time, but also for their founders' patience tonight. And thank you very much to you, our audience, for also bearing with us and for watching this recording. And we hope to see you in our next event. Thank you. And thank you, Lucy, organizing this. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, to our, thank you to our audience as well. And yeah. um, we hope to see you again at SOAS.